So, you know, the focus for today is really going to be about understanding the intersection of AI and crypto. What are the products that are being built across sort of various parts of the stack, right? All the way from the start. So how do you collect data, filter data, um, label data to how do you train models based on that data? How do you get the compute and the GPU power to do that? Once you've trained the models, how do you actually perform inference on them, actually use them, you know, send prompts, get an output. And then how do you actually do the verification and validation after all that work's been done that, hey, this, you know, this prompt was actually computed upon by this model. So what's awesome is we have teams that are building products at all stages of the stack, which I think will make for a really interesting conversation. And so the way we're going to structure this is we're going to first have um, each team, and we've got a bunch of them, um, give a quick one minute introduction on, on what, you know, who they are and what they're building. And after that, we'll spend a little bit of time on specific questions that we'd prepared for, for the audience, uh, or rather for the participants here. And then finally, we wanna leave some time for Q&A so that people in the spaces can, can ask, um, you know, the teams about, about thoughts on their minds. So that's the rough outline. But actually, before we get to that, we have a, a fun little bonus today, which is uh, Toli is here on the spaces with us. Um, Toli, if you want to kick us off, uh, you know, and say some, you know, what are your thoughts about AI and Solana? Was Solana built for machines? How do you see the future evolving in, you know, two or three minutes? That'd be awesome. Yeah, I mean, AI is is a is a space that's moving like really crazy fast. Um, just kind of mind bending how quickly things that I thought would take five years are, are now taking about a year to, to build. Um, so just really excited to be, uh, to be a part of it. I think um, at a high level, like already just me using these systems, I, I will like type something in and I get like a surprised prompt that like surprised answer back that, I'm not allowed to uh, to compute that, <laughs> which is kind of bizarre. Um, that we're seeing kind of maybe it's heavy-handed right now, and things and things will get more subtle. But for very innocuous things, you get like a response back that you're somehow violating some policy or another, and that feels like um, we need like decentralized systems just to provide an alternative. Um, you know, like I think big, large commercial systems are always going to tend to censor the the tail um, in every parameter, right? Because they're trying to maximize their revenue, um, and that's fine. But like, I think you need enough of them to where you cover all possible things that people want to do, right, across the spe of all spectrums. And um, the big companies that we have in the U.S. are pretty mid like across the board <laughs> so so we need we need alternatives um and i think like crypto has proven itself to iterate really quickly raise capital quickly um very quickly amass massive amounts of hardware as well so i think um there should definitely be decentralized ai systems providing every kind of part of functionality from you know trading cars to drive to generating movies to whatever. So re really excited to be here. My, my dream AI project. And, uh, I think this is something I'm planning to after breakpoint. I mean, I've talked about this, but <laughs> I don't know how realistic it is, but to basically take fire dancer and Solana, labs or ends a client code and then train a model to generate a third client based on those and see if I can, how far I can, I can take that. So maybe that's like a site project. I'll start after breakpoint. Hopefully there's a, a, it's running on a decentralized model that was trained by, um, in a decentralized way. So that'd be pretty cool. Happy to guinea pig anyone that's building, um, like software development tools and AI that are based on decentralized sources of data or running on decentralized hardware. Awesome. Thanks, Chantole. There we go. For people who are looking for a spark inspiration, maybe that's something to chew on. Um, 
Before we get to the teams, I think Dari has connected, uh, my colleague. So Dari, if you want to introduce yourself very quickly, and then we'll have the, the participants here uh, introduce themselves. Yeah, sorry about that. I was having some uh, technical difficulties. But yeah, uh, like uh, Colleen mentioned, my name is Dare, and I work at the foundation, both on BD and ecosystem growth efforts on a vertical that we call New Initiatives, which largely encompasses Deepin and AI. So yeah, super excited to be a part of this call today and hear from the teams that we have on. Thanks, Dare. All right, on to the teams themselves. And again, teams, please... We want to hear from you, but also there's a lot of folks here, so try to keep your intros to one minute. Mm. First up, if the wind slash grass team, if you guys want to introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. Uh, really happy to be here today. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm Andre. I'm one of the co-founders of Grass. Uh, we're essentially building AI's foundational data layer. Uh, at the moment, we've got close to a million nodes running distributed data provisioning jobs globally. Um, this involves everything from scraping the public web to pre-processing labeling, applying whatever necessary transformations are involved for data, and uh, ingesting all that into AI models. So, yeah, thanks, guys. Awesome to have you. Synesis One. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm Isaac. A CEO of Synesis One. So at Synesis One, um, we're building a platform that helps companies crowdsource raw data and data pre-processing tasks. So, um, you know, tagging, cleaning, labeling, annotating, and whatnot to get ready for training. And in addition to the data crowdsourcing app, we actually operate a Web2 AI company called MindAI. And we provide enterprise AI solutions to government and corporate clients. And of course, all the data needs are sourced through Synesis One. And our op, uh, app's currently live on Solana Mainnet, and then we're launching new campaigns every week. So super glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Isaac. All right. Render, I think we've got Jules and, and Trevor from the Render team. Yeah, you do. Um, I'm Jules Herbach. I'm the uh, founder of Render. Trevor, you want to introduce yourself to uh, Nick? Yeah, uh, CEO of Botoy and uh, Board of Directors at the Render Foundation. Well, I'm not here, Trevor, but uh, I'll give sort of the brief one minute on Render. I, my background is computer graphics and video games, and Render was built out of um, a need to, to let artists be able to create anything at any limit. I mean, we, we have software that targets GPU rendering. We've you know, collected pretty much every major player in the industry and allowed uh, them to leverage a uh, network of about a million high-end GPUs, obviously, as artist workflows evolving from just pure 3D, which is uh, where we started, uh, to AI. Uh, it's, it's getting super interesting. I think our vision um, for both AI and crypto, and of course, you know, we, we are in Solana. We've, we've been um, working with Tony and Raj for a while to make that happen, is to get to the holodeck. And it's interesting. You know, a lot of you know, the angst and, and excitement around AI is coming, of course, from Sam Altman. And you know, that's his goal, too. You just mentioned you know, we, he wants to see all this lead to a holodeck. And, you look at the results of what you're seeing with Sora, and it's clear that, you know, emergent uh, diffusion transform models are getting towards a simulated reality. We want to provide a decentralized um, platform for that to, to exist. Yeah, Sora has been wild. Um, yeah. Probably talk more about that in a bit, but uh, I own it. I think we've got Amazu. Go ahead. Hey guys, yeah, my name is Ahmed. I'm the founder of Ironet, currently holding both the CTO and CEO role. I'm the AI compute currency. We think there's a huge opportunity into you know, being in the middle of a remote inference on the planet one day. Um, and we're building Ironet. It's a cloud, uh, it's a decentralized computing network. We allow machine learning engineers to access distributed cloud clusters at mass, mass, mass scale. Um, targeting large-scale AI startups. Currently, by far, uh, we are we have 24,000 GPUs in the network, which is by far the largest uh, GPU network available uh, as a deep end of the industry. And we're growing uh, very fast. We, uh, we have around like 80% of the GPUs that can be used actually by AI engineers like the A100 and the H100s and so on. And yeah, we're looking forward to become um, what we call it, and we term this word, the Internet of GPUs, building the Internet of GPUs, um, a hidden network that's running the background, uh, computing um, any ML workload across the planet. 
I'm happy to be here. I'm building a Solana. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, and now I think we've got a, a few people who are joining us um, who aren't directly in the Solana ecosystem, but are absolutely at the forefront of the intersection of crypto and AI. Uh, and so I think we have Ben from Jensen. Ben, if you want to introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, happy to be here. I'm uh, Ben, the co-founder of Jensen. Um, so Jensen is a decentralized machine learning compute protocol. We generally view ourselves as building, like the, the closest analogy is TCP IP before the kind of machine learning uh, revolution, essentially. So if you think of TCP IP being the kind of enabling protocol of the uh, the last tech revolution, the internet that connected up all devices, uh, we think machine learning requires a, a similar thing, a similar connectivity layer uh, across compute specifically, because it's the most constrained resource um, within machine learning. Uh, there are other resources like data and expert knowledge that other people are working on, um, but we generally follow the thin protocol thesis. So we want to solve the compute problem um, very clearly with a, a very robust solution. So our kind of biggest sort of challenge is verification, and that's what we've spent a very kind of long time working on and solving. We think that for a real machine learning compute protocol to exist in the world and run all machine learning training, it needs to have built in the functionality to make sure that work is actually done correctly without having to call out to the kind of uh, the human world. So if you look at all of the ways that people access compute power right now via the cloud providers, via some of the kind of newer networks, uh, most of the time those are secured via legal contracts or via agreements or via trust in some way. Uh, we think for that to scale to what machine learning's kind of potential can actually be, all of that needs to be replaced with code. It needs to be purely programmatic. Um, and that enables a future where machines can trigger the training of machines. And we can have essentially what we have with the crypto Web3 ecosystem, but it's purely interactable via machines who are able to trigger the training, retraining, fine tuning, et cetera, of models themselves. Um, and that's what Jensen's heading towards. Um, we've been building that for uh, about four years now, and we're, we're coming up to launching out the first version of our protocol relatively soon for uh, close partners. So we're looking for anyone who, who wants to kind of try that out from a supply side or demand side. We'd be very happy to speak with people. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. And, and last but certainly not least, I think we have Jason and Dante from the EZKL team. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we're looking at the question, you know, how do you know that a model that you think ran is really the one that you agreed to ahead of time, that you paid for or that your regulator approved or that uh, is some other way agreed? How do you get a model to run as though it ran inside of a smart contract with the same level of certainty but without communication? And how do you incorporate private data? Um, private models um, into a machine learning computation. So how do you run an AI model on a secret and just work with the result? Um, and for us, the answer is to take that model and compile it into a zero knowledge proof. Um, so someone can prove that they ran the model on private or public data and got a certain result. And anyone can verify that um, with a verifier uh, that's either local or that's exists in a smart contract and then trigger actions based on that. So that's what we do. It's it's a modular piece, and I think it comp uh, plugs in with with whatever else is here is doing. Awesome. I guess I'll add on to that as well. I'm Dante, the CTO at Ezekiel. Uh, I would add that we're particularly focused on like highly adversarial environments, where basically you need to ensure that like some model that you've deployed hasn't been compromised or accidentally altered, uh, and this is particularly valuable for like critical decision-making pipelines or adversarial environments, such as, you know, a blockchain or something. Amazing. Um, and it's worth noting, there's only so many people we have on the panel. I think there's a bunch of projects actually that are also at the cutting edge of this stuff, teams like uh, Nosana and Koi and others who I think are in the audience. And hopefully we'll get to um, get their perspectives to later on. But uh, there are only so many sort of speaking slots, so tough decision how to get made. In any case, I think we appreciate everyone's time and the introductions, and so let's get to the meat of this. Uh, Dari, if you want to start walking us through some of the questions we had. Awesome, yeah. Really appreciate the introductions from all our guests. So, yeah, we can move into the uh, first topic of discussion, which is around uh, data. So, 
In AI, it's often said that data is king and that without access to high quality train, uh, high quality data, that training models to produce accurate outputs is difficult, if not impossible. So I kind of want to direct this question to the Cinesis One team as well, as well as the GRASS team. So looking at the data landscape, what do you think are crypto's main value adds? Is it creating more data? Is it creating better data? Is it protecting data privacy or is it something else? And how do you uh, envision crypto to provide this value add? So I'd love to hear from the Cinesis One and uh, GRASS team on this. Yeah, um, I would say all of the above and more, to be honest. Um, one of the big issues actually right now with open source data sets is the data poisoning problem. Uh, this is something that happens at two levels. Uh, one, websites displaying fake data upon detecting AI crawlers. Um, and two, malicious actors or advertisers purposely altering data sets before they're fed into AI models. Uh, Grass solves the first one by running on literally hundreds of thousands of residential devices, which makes it very difficult for web servers to rate limit them, change the data they show them, etc. Um, one thing I should preface that with, though, actually, is um, the fact that the data that Grass scrapes is all public web data. Um, there are other, you know, there's some content that uh, I guess others are providing that is login gated, stuff like that. Um, just because we value our users, uh, we, we don't really delve in that space. Um, but with regards to the second problem, um, that is certain actors retroactively changing the content of their data sets, we're able to link every data set to its source using a proof of request mechanism, which should live natively on Solana. Uh, we're also excited about adding more active forms of participation to our network. Um, generally, when you're dealing with synthetic data, it helps a lot to have uh, human, fe human feedback in the uh, reinforcement learning loop. Um, so some of you may have noticed this being teased on the GRASS dashboard. Um, and we just kind of saw this as a very natural next step, uh, given we have a funnel for just a very large globally distributed user base to take part in, uh, in these types of things. Awesome. Thank you for that. Also, would love to hear from the Cinesis One team. Have anything to add? Isaac, if you can hear us. Uh, I can hear you now. <laughs> Sorry, X is really buggy for me. Um, so on Cinesis One side, uh, we when we launched, we looked to solve a few issues that was happening in the whole Web2 um, data tagging. We can hear you. Hello, can you guys hear me? I can, yep. No, you're starting. Okay. Um, yeah, so one of the biggest issues um, happens to be on the payment side. So when it comes to data pre-processing tasks, these aren't high paying jobs. They're sort of micro tasks that um, often involve microtransactions. Uh, and this attracts a lot of people from developing nations, but as Many people know cross-border transactions are pretty costly and, and they're slow. So oftentimes what happens in these Web2 platforms is that you need to build up a, a certain amount of balance before you can withdraw. And there's always um, a large fee uh, when they're getting their payments. And even uh, certain countries, they don't have, you know, there's a lot of unbanked folks as well as um, things like PayPal isn't supported. So this makes a lot of traditional Web2 companies avoid certain regions as a whole when it comes to collecting data or doing data pre-processing from these um, countries. And this leads to a lot of underrepresentation when it comes to AI development. So creating this um, faster and better and more accessible payment uh, for these micro tasks allows people in these regions new opportunities um, and it also gives uh, sort of the, the access, inclusion, and representation in, in uh, AI development for these people. So um, I think that's one of the biggest impacts that that uh, blockchain has on the whole data side of AI. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate the uh, thoughtful answers. So now we want to transition into our next topic, which is around compute. So with the continued growth of AI 
there's obviously a clear need for computational capacity to support its growth. And there have been many um, issues ranging from GPU shortages to prohibitive computational costs for AI research. And as I'm sure you're aware, there's the um, narrative that's been arising of pooling compute resources together in order to address these efforts. And many teams that are on this call are leading this charge from Render to Ionet to Jensen. So this question will be directed towards them. So how uh, does a decentralized GPU service compete against a centralized service? Is it on cost? Is it on access? Or is it on some other criteria? And let, let me put it another way. Let's say if I'm a business and I heavily use models, why should I use a decentralized GPU cluster versus an AWS or Azure? I, I can take that off first if nobody else minds. I mean, I, I feel... In, in the case of what we've been doing um, at Render, you know, we started um, so long ago that it was, you know, prior to AWS even having a single GPU, uh, you know, we helped build that for them back in uh, 2013. And just running Render jobs, this is before AI, you know, the AI crunch that we have today, I mean, we just run out of capacity. And, you know, the spondence and pricing in AWS, uh, you'd never reach that because the on-demand pricing or the reserve instance pricing would, you know, you, you saturate those, those nodes. And that's why Render was created, because I realized that, you know, there's hundreds of millions of GPUs out there. Um, NVIDIA, obviously, for data centers, forcing you to buy very expensive ones. So in the case of just, you know, at, at one layer of what we're providing at Deepin, right, there's, I mean, the, the time to finish a render, whether you're ILM or Disney, and by the way, entire, you know, studio movies have been rendered on, on decentralized nodes in our system with end-to-end -end encryption. You know, you're getting faster speed, you're getting one-tenth the cost, and you have massive availab availability. And, you know, from the perspective of having a ledger that they can authenticate what a image is or where the data came from, I and mean, that's built into the crypto part of it. We have proof of render. So it's a win on every level. When it comes to AI workloads, I mean, a ton of things that are related to generative AI on the inference and on the training side also fit to the kinds of GPUs that are ready on render. I mean, you don't need an H100 for, uh, you know, for doing tra training on generative video, even. I mean, there are things that, that map really well to that. And I think one of the more exciting propositions, at least for us, is that we look at the Apple ecosystem where you have GPUs with 128 gigs of video memory that, you know, you know match what you get in the server. Um, you know, that's, those, are, those are out there in the, in the millions, in the tens of millions. And tapping into that, I think, is going to be a, a massive win over the costs and the scaling issues you have on centralized clouds. And I think if you're training chat to 5 maybe what we have on the decentralized nodes is not quite quite there yet, but that's not the the future of, of generative um, yeah, content for, for media. And I think that's where we're seeing a huge advantage in decentralized approaches like ours. Yeah, thank you, Jules. I would like to add like um, one more thing here. So within the analysis, I think maybe uh, if you guys have seen our uh, Solana Breakpoint um, launch conference, we were talking about the AI compute requirements and how it was growing in the, in the last 10 years. So. In the last 10 years, the AI computer requirement has been doubling every three and a half months. Then I'm talking about the last 10 years. So that was consistent. Every three and a half months, we need more compute, more GPUs, uh, stronger GPUs, higher T-flops, more RAM, more, more gigabyte, more VRAM in the GPUs. And uh, it, basically, we can't compete on price shortly. But at the end, the, these cloud providers, yes, they do pay some enterprise licensing fees and so on, but also they're very well funded and they can, um, how to say, can optimize prices much better than any deep end can do uh, on the long run, right? Um, so some of them could fund cheaper prices or so on, but at the end, the supply price, you know, it'd be, it'd competing in price wouldn't be that right competition. But what really, what really is going on is the first thing. Uh, let's start with compute power. So as we know, compute power is growing and doubling every three and a half months. It's 10 times every 18 months. Uh, so we need more and stronger compute power. And we all have seen the Sora, the new uh, OpenAI uh, model that generates videos. And currently, an A100 can generate a video stable diffusion in one second. Now, when, uh, when such new 
we're, we're getting into the video, right? We are getting into the video. When we get into video, uh, we are even we need more GPUs than what we need, and that's exactly fits the double compute requirements every three and a half months. So uh, what's going on right now is yes, the models are, are getting every three and a half months. They need more and more and more compute power, and not as more of quantity, but also more of of new models like the H100 and all this new one. Why? Because yes, I can generate uh, more most. LLMs, they don't need that. But when we're talking about, let's say, you know, I'm, I'm playing a video game, and then this AI model is is literally changing the landscape of the game just because I like such design. As you saw with the solar model, you were, the video would suddenly switch to another environment based on the prompt. So if we're, you know, I'm playing a cars game, and this, the environment is New York City, and then suddenly I say, you know what, I want desert, and I just click that, and it will like, generate that. Let's look at the compute requirements here. First of all, you need a lot of GPUs because it's video. Second, which AWS can't compete with, is location. So AWS can't have GPUs in, uh, you know, in, uh, in 150 countries. And now, right now, we have uh, 45 country, 47 countries, GPUs in 47 countries, which is in locations more than what AWS can reach. And also, you know, once we unleash the, uh, um, the wait list, we're talking about at least, you know, 75 countries already, like, you know, prepped and ready to join the network. And that, what's the important is that, and it was, I'm playing the end of change my environment by sending a prompt to the model that is hosted on the cloud somewhere, and then bringing me back the result. We're talking about latency. So, latency and then the only way to optimize the yeah I'm out. I think you might be dropping in and out for a bunch of us um, and so I might actually suggest as we sort of figure out that connection issue Ben if you want to add anything from the Jensen perspective on this topic yeah, we'd love to jump in here. Um, I actually, so I actually disagree with with one of the points there that was around um, how the the centralized clouds will win on price. I think, in a short term perspective, the centralized clouds like AWS have large amounts of money that they can use to subsidize their like compute and their GPUs in that way that they probably can for a short period of time undercut the kind of protocols that come along and try to offer a fair market price for. Uh, ben, I think I accidentally just muted everyone. <laughs> if you if you unmute yourself, <laughs> no worries. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't. Uh, no, no worries. I don't know where I got to. Um, well, basically, I was saying the the centralized clouds have the the kind of firepower to over the short term subsidize their compute and kind of undercut other players. But if you look at just protocol dynamics in general, um, if you build a protocol that allows anyone to pretty easily and effectively connect up their compute power to a network and start offering it out for uh, use by others. What you create is a huge uh, supply and demand market where the marketplace itself doesn't need to create a profit. Uh, and it's a very different model to something like AWS. AWS over the long term is ultimately driven by shareholder profits. It needs to make a profit to continue to exist, which means that they're happy to undercut and use their balance sheet to drive out competitors, but they can't do it forever. And they need to have a credible path to, for some reason, winning that market. And I think what we're seeing with things like uh, compute marketplaces, that just doesn't work in the long run. A protocol will always be the cheapest option over the long term. Um, and so then it's what does a protocol do and how does it co connect up all of the supply and the demand uh, to capture this market? And we think that there's kind of two main ways it does that. On the supply side, it drives down the cost of entry. So right now, if you do want to kind of do the sort of CapEx to OpEx conversion on GPUs, i.e. you want to buy up a chunk of GPUs and you want to start offering them out for some kind of hourly rate, there's a lot of things that you need to do to do that. Um, and there's a lot of things in the kind of human world that you have to put in place. And generally, the administrative costs of doing that outweigh the benefits that you'll receive, which is why we don't have a huge amount of competition within the cloud space. 
Um, what Jensen's doing is replacing all of those administrative costs, those things that people currently do, like legal contracts and support and infrastructure and things like that, with technology that is just open source and can be run by anyone. And that means essentially, if you have a few GPUs, you'll be able to run our technology and become a cloud provider. Um, and so it drastically increases the, the kind of surface area of the supply side, which inevitably drives down those prices. Uh, and crucially, it doesn't take a margin because it's a protocol. The other side of it is that demand side, and, and that's what we see growing massively, uh, like we were hearing about just before. Um, I think we all believe here that the demand side for machine learning compute is going to continue to explode. Machine learning is going to be in every single product that we use. I think every technology we interact with will move from being kind of imperative code to probabilistic models. And we'll probably, as society, have to go through a lot of kind of weird changes when that happens, but it is inevitable because of the power of these models. When that gets deeper and more embedded, we're going to need those authentication uh, mechanisms and verification mechanisms that we've talked about. Like the idea that if I trigger the training of a model, I need to know that that was done correctly. And currently, I just trust the cloud providers. I trust that I've got legal contracts backing it up. And I know that I can go via the courts to settle that out in the future. That's not going to be enough for the future use. It's going to need to settle out instantly, and Web3 gives us a perfect way of doing that. It's just quite hard to apply that to something like machine learning. And that's where the, the, the Ezekiel guys are doing some fantastic work as well. I think there's a lot of people working on this. It's required for way many more things than just compute um, marketplaces and verification. It's also required for attribution and for, for um, the valuation of data and, and all of these things, for trusting that the models have been, done, have been executed correctly. Um, but I think the supply and the demand side need both of those things to um, to actually kind of capture this full market. Um, and while we talked about price, I think price is one of the aspects, but there's also scale and, and just general access to compute um, that, that these protocols enable as well. Totally. Actually, one thing maybe, and hopefully Hamad's uh, connection will have resolved itself or whatever, X will have fixed their shit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. we, we can come back to this like discussion on price and like where do we think decentralized GPU compute options net out against centralized ones. I think that's an interesting one, maybe in the Q&A section. But um, I think we, we, we actually have a nice transition into uh, the next topic we wanted to, to talk about. And, and Daria, I'll let you take this on, on authentication. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, Ben started to allude to it. But for the next uh, topic, I wanted to transition into authentication. So. We've, we've touched on data, and I imagine in the future a world where millions of data sets will exist, some in alignment with certain data privacy laws, others designed with certain data collection techniques that accounts for biases, etc. And then I feel like arises the issue of authentication. So how, uh, how do we know that a model was trained with a specific data set? How do we verify a specific model was used to answer a prompt? Um, I want to direct this question specifically to the EZKL team, but then would also love if Render, Jensen, and Ionet chimed in on this, because I think there's definitely some crossover. So what kinds of verification do you think are going to be the most important in the next one to three years? Is it going to be verifications of training data, uh, models used, verifications of training techniques or something else? Why is that? And how do you envision a blockchain like Solana being a part of that solution or blockchains in general? Jason or uh, yeah. Dante? Um, so I think he's asking about, I, I'm hearing him on delay, but uh, verification of what types of verification are most important. Um, so I think practically a lot of people are interested in uh, verification of training. Um, I tend to think that that's, that's going to take longer to figure out. I think verification of, of inference, verification of transformations, and verification of performance are the things that uh, are more accessible in the near term. I think um, one of the examples that Dari gave is, is uh, both privacy and biases. I think one of the most exciting things that we can do with verifiable machine learning is to um, 
you know, a lot of us are going to be kind of below the algorithm, right? A lot of us are going to be susceptible to the decisions of an AI um, that can make real impact in our life. And we're giving more and more power to these to these machines. Um, and how do we know as as a recipient, recipient of those decisions that that judgment was fair, right? Um, and one way to do that is we can prove the performance of a model on a particular data set without revealing the model and then deliver to the end user who receives, receives the judgment, whether it's, you know, your, your CV was accepted or you were screened at TSA or whatever. Um, you're, you're able to be, to receive a certificate that it, it came with the, came from the model that everyone agreed was the one that ought to be run. Um, so it's kind of like a separate question from something like AI safety, right? AI safety is kind of what should the models do? And what something like ZKML that we're building with Ezekiel does is it, it lets you say, um, if we know what the model should do, is that the, what the model actually did, right? Um, was there an attacker that was able to interfere with it at some place, it's somewhere along the line? Um, you know, if someone, if it was running on another person's machine, um, were they able to inject something uh, before or after the decision? That kind of stuff. Um, so it's really a way to kind of like secure those decisions, make sure that the thing that happens is the thing we expected. That's why it plugs in so well with some of the other themes around around decentralization. Um, yeah, I would add as well that um, I guess like verifiability is always going to add a certain degree of overhead, whether it's optimistic that, or yeah. cryptographic. Um, so Another thing that comes up sometimes is kind of uh, identity verification. So using a model to decide uh, who a person is. And that, to me, that was one of the most exciting themes early on, kind of um, the world coin type model, right? How do we how do we identify a human as an actor? I think to some extent that has become less of an important theme um, because of things like pass keys. Um, uh, oh, is Dante speaking as well? Um, <laughs> Jason, can you hear us? I think you might just be hearing stuff on a delay. Yeah. Which is what I suspect is happening. Okay. But finish your thought, I think, and then chime in. Uh, yeah, so so I was just saying around authentication, I think I think pass keys are probably the way um, that is a little bit more practical than than running it uh, actually in a decentralized way, although although we'll see. Um, I think that it's interesting. One of the things I think we're a little bit uh, uh, kind of respectfully d d disagree about the pricing thing. I guess if I had to bet, I'd, I'd bet that, that it's going to be more expensive to do things in a decentralized way long term. Um, however, I think it's extremely important that we have that capability, right, in order to kind of hold the, hold the fire uh, and prevent over centralization. So I think it's like really important from a political kind of freedom point of view. Um, and so I'm very happy that people are working on that. Okay. Awesome. And, and Dante, I think you, you had wanted to add something in case uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, sure. what, what Jason was saying. Yeah, yeah. So I was just I was just mentioning, and I think Jason briefly touched on this, uh, is the idea that like um, verifiability is going to introduce a certain amount of overhead and already training is, you know, we had speakers beforehand saying that we're running out of GPUs to train. If you add verifiability on top of that, maybe there's not enough compute on the planet to just <laughs> verify the models that we want to verify. Um, and if you think about where models are going to have the most impact, um, it's when they're deployed, right? And they're running inferences and they're in critical pathways. Um, and so it's really our thesis that like verifying inference, you know, when a model is making decisions that have downstream impacts, is basically where a lot of like early value is going to be. Um, and I guess internally we've struggled a little bit to formulate a more cogent thesis around verifying training. Um, but like verification of inference clearly has some value add in like extremely adversarial situations. Like for example, again, like a blockchain, pretty adversarial, you know, you're interacting and transacting. Um, and there's lots of actors that could potentially want to compromise the model that is like managing funds, for example. Totally. Uh, I know uh, Jules had, had something to add here. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's a great discussion. You know, the thing about the way that we architected Render was that it was built, I mean, you know, it, it has a deterministic output, right? You, you, you can have 3D models, textures, how there's even, there is AIV noisy and there are AI filters that you have in this process. 
And, you know, there's always a human or somebody requesting that that is generated. And the system works. I mean, it allows you to basically run these, I mean, you know, if you're talking purely on inference, you know, the output is something that the initiator validates. And I think that's one way of dealing with, with authentication and, um, and proof of composition, right, which is important. If, you know, and I focus you know, specifically on, on things like what Sora is you know, getting towards, where we have an entire scene or entire simulation, what components are used in there? I mean, all the training may be coming from videos, but you can also probably see there's stuff that's coming from simulators like Unreal Engine or our renderer, for example. And I also think that the workloads of the future, whether it's inference or or rendering or ray tracing, it might be a mix. You know, there's a lot of, of, of value to, to, not, to using less energy. And I feel like those kinds of systems lend themselves well to being authenticated. There's one other area though, when you're talking about where the data comes from, um, you know, we've done, as much as we've done with rendering and, and CG graphics, another part of our business has been digital doubles, right? Humans. And we've been doing that for 15 years. We've had high quality scans of every single actor multiple times. And I think that's an area where, especially with the, you know, the concern over deep fakes and generative video, um, tricking people. I mean, having the ability to take, um, your identity visually, right, or your, your voice, and tag that and put any sort of rights and restrictions you want around that is exactly why we wanted to build render, you know, on blockchain and where we look to leverage Solana in the future. Uh, and with that, you know, we, we work with the, uh, you know, with the talent agencies, there's a lot of, you know, stuff going on with, of course, SAG and, and providing protection for actors. But when you think about it from that perspective, Ultimately, um, what, when you're generating a face or, or, or anything that is, um, you know, visual, it's something we can map to what render already does. And I feel confident that that can work on. I mean, trying to get something that's more diffuse, that might be different, but anything related to the audio visual simulation realm, I think can lend itself really well to, to pretty strong authentication and, uh, and sourcing. You know, every, everything that goes into a training or inference step, at least on render, we can we can tag hash and and provide a receipt for um, and even pay out royalties right to uh, to, uh, to contributors and it goes back to the value proposition of an NFT which in my mind sh was shouldn't be the JPEG that people does at the end but the actual data and three D scene and even the models he uses to the oppose it can all be you know built into a smart contract that pays things out similar to you know people getting royalty checks for being in a TV show that goes into syndication I mean that's kind of the future where. I see the value proposition of, of you know, the blockchain and verifiable generate, generative AI on, on systems like Render um, really changing the game. Thank you, Jules. And I know Ben also had a, wanted to add on this topic. So Ben, I think in the interest of time, it, if uh, we can be, we'll have to have to limit your time on this one a little bit, unfortunately. I think we've got one more question, then we want to make sure we have time for uh, the audience to get to answers, uh, ask some questions too. No worries. I can I can speed run my uh, my point here. Um, the the point was basically just I I absolutely disagree again with um, some of the points around uh, verification of inference versus training. I think if you actually if you look at um, verification as what Jason said, it's it's kind of checking that the thing that I expected to happen has actually happened. When I look at inference, I see some niche use cases where it's very important that. Uh, verification happens. So there's some sort of uh, things like if on-chain um, trading is happening, if I'm making a model which is going to uh, perform some inference against some kind of data and then trade on my behalf, I want to know exactly what that model is doing and I want to be able to audit it. But if I look at something like inference against a language model, a chat app or something like that, and then I look at the current situation, OpenAI doesn't really give us any guarantees about which model they're running, yet everybody still uses their APIs because they can verify with their experience what is actually happening. Either they like the interaction with the model or they don't like it. And they don't necessarily need this programmatic verification of that model to know that it's doing the thing that they expect as a user. I think when you look at training, though, that changes a little bit because you have uh, an adversary which, um, if you're doing this over a compute network, that adversary is incentivized to do less work in order to get more payment. Uh, and it's similar to the kind of the dark forest concept with Ethereum, where like if there was a way to, as a participant in the Ethereum network, do a little bit less work and still get paid the same amount of money, we assume that people would do it. And uh, at Jensen, we assume the same thing out of a compute network. Uh, so in that way, you need to be able to verify the training was done correctly, but you need to do it. And uh, again, similar to what, what Jason said, you need to verify that what the user expects happened actually happened up to a level of confidence for that user. And so to us, that leads to just a pragmatic verification system where at some points you need the robustness of 
uh, a ZKML solution where you want to go really, really deep and you want to do a lot of extra work to make sure that that work was done correctly. And in other cases, you can have a game theoretic security where to a certain level of confidence, you're you're happy that that was done correctly. Um, so we think the, the design of a verification system for training is essential, but also it doesn't necessarily need to be as robust as, say, you would do for verification of a hedge fund trading model on Ethereum doing inference. That would need a, a very robust ZKML solution. Maybe you can have a combination of that ZKML with um, some of the more kind of optimistic roll-up style um, solutions. And that's, what, that's the approach that we take. Um, but I do think it's, in my mind, clearer for training than it is for verification, apart from I think uh, the sound might have dropped, but I appreciate all the answers from everybody. And uh, like Colleen mentioned, just one more topic before we move into the uh, Q&A session. So um, we've covered a wide range of uh, different topics, um, and these teams are building within each of these verticals, and we've seen that there's some crossover. So then for this next uh, component that I want to move into... Um, there, there. We can see that uh, the one unifying factor between all these different teams are the on-chain components. So I want to tailor this question to all the different uh, teams on this call, basically. And some can feel free to chime in, but then also we'll have time during the end for Q&A. So what are the most important aspects of a blockchain for the product that you're building? Is it speed? Is it cost? Is it decentralization, storage, or is it something else? We'd just love to hear briefly from teams on what's the most important aspect about a blockchain for what they're building. Yeah, and maybe because I know that some people are on delays and, you know, space is this amazingly designed product that doesn't fail ever. I'm just going to I'm just going to prompt people so that uh, we can keep this moving along. So maybe as a starting point, uh, you know, Isaac, uh, Sinesis, if you want to give us your quick take on the most important thing for you. Yeah, for us, um, when we were designing a product, the most important thing was uh, speed and cost because all of the data um, work that users do is uh, recorded on chain. All the votes for people submitting or people reviewing the data as well as people submitting and whatnot. So we wanted to create as much of a Web2 experience for these users as much as possible because uh, most of our users are actually um, new to crypto. Uh, so those were the most important thing when we um, started building. Awesome. And uh, Andre, what about uh, from the grass wind perspective? Yeah, honestly, um, it comes down to transaction costs, speed, and uh, the ecosystem that... Uh, that's available on that chain to partner with. Well, that all right. So we're seeing some some commonalities. Uh, Ahmad, if you're back, hopefully we can hear you this time. Sure, can you hear me? Yep. Great. So I think for us, uh, the reason we built on Solana is basically we're trying to be you know to build this compute network. Uh, first of all, it's composed of the compute layer, which have all the GPUs and the workers and all the orchestration that happens to you know, provide compute services and verification of that compute services. Now, these providers of compute, uh, they are from across the planet, and simply Solana Pay is an amazing uh, you know, solution for market transactions on small jobs or big jobs and so on, with no questions asked uh, on paying out these users um, since it's permissionless. Now, that's on the first level. On the second level, why we insist on Solana is because of the fire dancer, the fire dancer coming in. Because IO next level is the you know next layer is the IO models, and IO models there basically uh, you know we're expecting hundreds of thousands of models deployed in the IO network, and all these models are going to be used by um, you know app builders who want to build some kind of like front end or whatever and they will utilize these models they will grab it from the store just like hugging face you know there's 450,000 models in hugging face you could grab any model download it and they use it or use it in your own app or build an app on top of it or even build a whole startup on top of it uh, so for us we think this model store is something is going to be like the something really huge and 
uh, when we like when we analyze the systems we need to design such uh, infrastructure, uh, we find out that if, for example, we have a hundred thousand model, and then uh, one of the models, you know, one startup founder came in and said, "Hey guys, I'd like to use one of these models on the on the on the model layer." Uh, he grabbed the model and he started building on it, and it deploys automatically uh, on the IO network. Then you know there will be you know hundreds of thousands of inferences on this model a day, or maybe a month. It depends on how successful the startup become. So this is just like a use of one of the models that could be multi used by multiple startups. So not one startup could use the same. So we could have a hundred startups using the same model. Uh, one model could be from all the four, you know hundred thousand model we would have uh, would become so successful that it has a million inference per day. Or if or, um, yeah, and then uh, we need to pay for this uh, owner of the model royalty fee. And the only way to pay this royalty fee at such low trend. Um, Solana network, because Solana network then. One, uh, uh oh, the curse is back. Um, I'm not adding you're in and out again, so I might uh, have us go to either <laughs> Jules or Trevor if you guys can hear us. Hopefully, yeah, I got um, you. I think I'm right yeah. this. So perfect. Oh. Ahead, thanks. Robert. Thanks, Owen. So last year we had a, a spirited community vote on this topic, and I think the key driving factors in our blockchain selection were, were cost and speed. So um, agreeing with the first two there, but I'd add some more um, technology. Uh, as Jules had said, you know we believe proof of creation is going to become more and more of a central issue in the age of AI. I think uh, quite relevant. I, I got a fake totally YouTube airdrop video just last week, so uh, very central. Um, for us, compressed NFTs were really interesting as a key on-chain part of the solution for this. So technology was, was really central. And then lastly, to repeat on the ecosystem, um, you, you know, having a mature, deep in community in the Solana ecosystem really helped us. Uh, a shout out to Helium and others who, who helped bridge. And finally, the, the founding team being accessible and engaged um, made it a, a really clear choice. Awesome. And uh, Ben, if you want to give the Jensen perspective. Oop, I think we have to get him back as a speaker. Um, maybe while we do that, uh, Dante and um, Jason, if you guys want to opine. Yeah, sure. So um, a couple of thoughts about, about choice of blockchain. I think, of course, fundamentally, cost and speed are important, particularly cost and support for uh, cryptographic operations. Right, um, because we think of zk as one way to think about zk is as an acceleration technology for for blockchain that lets you put more stuff into a smart contract. Um, that means you get to amortize that cost, but you still have to pay it at some point. So that's important. But perhaps the most important thing um, that we're looking for in a blockchain is kind of a little bit more meta. It's epistemological, right? Because we produce a prover and a verifier, and Everyone has to agree that if the model is verified against that verifier, uh, the conditions that we set for it have been achieved, right? Um, and if that verifier lives in an ordinary database, that can be tampered with, right? Um, but if it lives in the blockchain uh, and is protected by consensus, um, that gives a really solid kind of final source of truth for what makes sense. And that's one of the reasons it's appealing. Totally. And uh, Ben? Yeah, I think for us, um, probably two really clear um, places where a blockchain is required. And, and for Jensen, we came at this originally from outside of the crypto space. We kind of discovered crypto and, and blockchain as a technological solution to a problem that we were looking to solve um, without that originally. So how do you connect up every GPU, TPU, CPU in the world and allow them to be used by anyone? Um, one of the biggest problems you have to solve there is trust um, and establishing trust and establishing the idea of, of breaking a dispute between two parties who don't know or trust each other um, was prior to blockchain just a kind of impossible task. You always needed a trusted third party to break that. And there was a light bulb moment for us when we realized that 
that's kind of the power of um, a blockchain. It allows you to have arbitration using consensus of groups of people who don't trust each other, um, which is really, really powerful. And you can get that in different ways. You can get it uh, by using an existing layer one, or you can kind of build your own layer one. You, as long as you can somehow terminate a dispute on a chain, then you can achieve that. The other big thing that you need to do is payments. And I think people have touched on this here. Um, generally, uh, within building anything like this, you need very, very fast uh, micropayments with very low cost. If you think about the idea of um, facilitating a payment between anyone on the planet and anybody else to do a tiny amount of computational work, if you were using Visa or something like that for that, it would just get, it would explode in terms of costs. You need something that can, can settle very, very quickly and very, very cheaply uh, at kind of any granularity level. Um, and for us, the decision was was quite clear that the best way to do that was to build as a layer one. But I can 100% see why uh, there would be reasons to to attach yourself to a, an existing layer one that already provides those things. Um, and we would, if we didn't have the reasons we, we have for, for building as a layer one, we'd definitely consider uh, existing layer ones for that. Because there's a lot of kind of difficulties to uh, putting in payments infrastructure and things that if a project doesn't need to build that themselves, in my opinion, they definitely shouldn't. Um, because like Solana are, are spending a lot of time thinking about really deep problems um, in, in how you solve those those problems. And yeah, you, if you don't have to think about solving those problems, probably don't think about it. Let somebody else do it. Uh, unfortunately, we do have to think about it. All right. Um, super interesting set of criteria there. And I guess cost and speed and stuff seem, and, and the ability to execute a lot of payments um, across the world that are small seems like a common theme. Super interesting. Um, it's sort of, in some ways, crypto is like payments all the way down. Uh, in any case, um, I think that concludes the like sort of formatted part of the uh, spaces. We now wanted to open up a little bit to having some questions from the audience for the next 10 minutes or so. So this is going to run a little bit late. I hope that's okay with folks. And if we don't have questions from the audience, I actually, I think there's a few points of discussion that came up earlier today where there was a little bit of a, uh, you know, different viewpoints. And so I would love to double click into those. But um, before that, if folks want to raise their hand, then myself or Ian or Dare can, can bring folks up to ask their question. I only ask that you um, try to keep the questions short and ideally direct it to one or two people, uh, specific people in the, uh, on the panel. All right, I'm not sure if I see any hands, or maybe it's just the Twitter Spaces UI is awful. Um, oh, we got we have one. Fun, Dad. All right. I think um, Nico uh, requested in your speaker now, so you can ask your question. Ah, cool. Thank you. I uh, just was waiting for you guys to let me ask the question. So the question is like what we have seen the latest days in AI is that there is this new chips coming out, for example, Grok that came out with this like LPU that's like amazing. And probably also we want to see maybe in a few weeks or a few months or ever else with another like huge chip. And this has some similarities with what happened with crypto mining before that you were able to mine crypto using GPUs, but then we went to like a more custom hardware. And uh, the question then is like, how is this going to impact a lot of like the decentralized uh, GPU providing systems? Is this going to like push out a lot of people that have like normal NVIDIAs and this is going to move to more like custom hardware? So it's like kind of an open question in that regard. Thank you. Happy to uh, to jump in here and uh, and take this from my side. It's something we think about a lot. We we generally see the parallels that you described with the crypto mining markets, and we, we think the same thing is going to happen here, where um, custom ASICs, in a way, for machine learning have been have been on the way for a while. It's a very difficult problem to solve, um, ultimately because you have to 
balance generalizability with uh, the benefits of going kind of more specific and, and building an ASIC for these operations. And um, there's been a, quite a few companies over the past decade plus who've been trying to build custom machine learning chips. And what they find is they'll make certain design decisions that work with the current way that machine learning models work. Um, and then actually the research will change and people will try a different type of model construction and that won't work with the, the hardware anymore. And if you've ossified models into hardware, hardware in that way, uh, but then the models have moved on. You've just spent a lot of money building a chip that now lo no longer has value. Um, I think what we've seen with the, the language models recently is people are confident enough now in language models and in the transformer architectures that they're happy to do that ossification process and move to specific chips. But it's still not certain whether the, the space will move on again. I, I mean, RNNs are kind of coming back after they've been through a, a weird little bit of a winter. Um, back for, for language modeling a few years ago, they were the uh, the technique du jour and then transformers came along i personally wouldn't want to commit to a specific architecture now and turn it into hardware i think it's a little bit early but obviously people are doing it uh, from jensen's perspective what we expect to happen is uh, we put the network out and people are provisioning gpus to it similar to how people used to mine bitcoin on laptops and then over time people will just make better chips for doing this and you'll end up with a rich marketplace where at the kind of bottom end you've got the weaker gpus and maybe you've got some cpus and at the top end you've got people with custom chips that are happening to make uh, much more money because they can do faster processing of the AI tasks. But they're just taking more risk because they're investing in chips that might suddenly become obsolete. Whereas if you're using a more generalizable chip like a GPU, you know it's going to persist. It's going to be able to do most operations into the future. So it just becomes that kind of like risk trade-off for a supply-side participant where there'll be different people with different uh, risk appetites who will be committing to different pieces of hardware, essentially. I, I wouldn't mind jumping in if there's no one else you know, has another thoughts. I mean, I, I would say that, you know, I've been around this space so long that I've seen everything from general purpose, you know, uh, video compression be put into ASICs. I mean, another example, imagination technologies created ray tracing hardware like years before NVIDIA did RTX. And, you know, when you have something that works well as an ASIC for a large portion of, of tasks, whether it's AI or, or rendering, I mean, the big players will, will bake it in. You know, my iPhone 15 ships with ray tracing hardware, right? It's, it's, it's something that's, that's in there. And, you know, our, it just, it just even testing, you know, Apple's GPUs, you know, the M2 for doing inference, um, on a lot of tasks. I mean, they have obviously, um, specialized processors for their no launch and stuff. It's, it's like half the speed of a 4090, but it's obviously using a lot less power. And I just think that the big players are always going to try to, you know, put whatever the best of class, you know, hardware is, uh, even if it's something that you could put in a separate ASIC. And again, I mean, you know, you're just going to see that that even on Apple's case, I mean, they're going to be putting generative AI locally on devices. They're going to need to build stuff that's able to do that from LLMs to all those pieces. They've obviously saturated like all the three nanometer nodes, right, at TSMC. So I just feel like it, it's interesting. I'm, I'm certainly tracking it, but I also think that you're going to see the big players also leverage, you know, custom hardware and ASIC um, elements that could be embedded on you know, current SOCs and current high-end GPUs or low-end GPUs, that's just my two cents. Do we have any other question uh, askers lined up, uh, Ian or Dari? No, um, we don't actually, but... Um, I actually had a question for the uh, Nosana team that's also a listener. Hopefully you guys can request to speak and we can hear from you guys. But um, the Nosana team is also building within the um, GPU cluster, um, and they're, they're launched on Solana. So I would love for the Nasana team to chime in, basically, on, um, on this discussion, if they have anything to add on that front. would love to hear from them. You guys can request, but um, if someone else would like to ask a question in the meantime while they're requesting, feel free to do so. Yeah, there's a few people who have asked questions. Oh, there we go. We got them. Hi, guys. This is Rosa from Nasana. Uh, first of all, thank you for the shout out. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and we really also enjoyed the AMA and appreciate all the insights for the uh, answers of everyone. So, yeah, to reply to your questions, uh, yeah, the last couple of months have been incredibly successful for us. 
Um, in particular, with Test Grid Phase One, it went great. So, first of all, thank you to to the community. We really appreciate the support, but also the input. Um, now we are moving forward with the preparation of Phase Two. Uh, we're working hard to start it later this year and leverage the great results of Phase, of phase One. Uh, so for anyone interested, so AI builders, AI projects, GPU owners, and so on, feel free to keep a close eye on our socials um, as important information and announcements will be shared very soon. Um, also, we are at super pumped about our recent partnership with a friend here, uh, Render. And uh, we have more coming as well. So we aim to leverage all these partnerships uh, in different angles. And obviously, we are for the collaboration around AI and Web3, as there are like so many synergies that have to be that, that, that have to be leveraged. So if you want to be part of this journey, feel free to contact us uh, because we are building this for you and with you guys. So once again, thank you for the shout out, uh, and we're looking forward to to build with all of you guys. Thanks a ton. I think we'll, we've got one, maybe one question, uh, and then we'll have to adjourn us. Solza, babe. Hey, how you doing? The whole name. Uh, it's just hey. Solza, babe. Appreciate it. Uh, a question for Jules and Trevor and Render. Um, just a quick one. Uh, I am just curious if you guys have ever thought about something like um, Power Ledger, the Australian project for offsetting power usage for the expansion of how much AI and rendering is going to increase over the next five to 10 years. So using basically a decentralized grid system to offset energy uh, and uh, like, yeah, just rendering cost and rendering jobs and then eventually yeah, AI training with these large data center, uh, just uh, GPU uh, farms. It's the uh, main question there. I can, I can try and answer. Um, so I mean, well, yeah. Trevor may, may take a stab at that. I have my own thoughts. I'll, I'll let Trevor maybe give a yeah. first pass at that, and I'll add in any other pieces I think are worth uh, worth mentioning. So, so thanks. Um, I, I think one of the differences on um, rendering and, and the render network is that the GPU usage is um, actually doing real work, physical work. It's essentially doing the render. Um, and and so um, you, you know it's, it's fairly hard um, on that front um, to um, to remove the cost associated with it, but particularly offset could yeah could be something along the way. For us, uh, choice of blockchain was also a critical part in this. I, I think you know um, it is less than the energy of a tweet um, on the Solana side. So um, that was an element to it, but um, we've got a, a decentralized network here with folks contributing from all around the world. So you're, you're going to have very different energy usage um, across the board, um, you know, depending on where they're located in their, their own country and, and local physical energy requirements. So it makes it challenging, um, at least uh, from a, a reduction side. But the offset side are, are interesting, um, not something we've really chased so far. Um, and I'll, I'll turn to Jules if he wants to add. Well, I, I, unfortunately, I couldn't hear what Trevor was saying because uh, I guess the tech behind the piece is, isn't, uh, isn't perfect. Um, but I was just going to say that, you know, we've been... Um, I mean, there's just been a lot of, of, of thought going into, obviously, whatever we're running on the render network. I mean, at least it, it's it's real work, right? I mean, it's, it's you know, humans are requesting they need it for their livelihood or or for a purpose that is, you know, something that, that is the offset from local GPU power. Um, and so from that perspective, we're not really, you know, we're not wasting energy. And I'd say that there's also, um, you know, a benefit to having uh, the decentralized approach effectively spread the work out. Uh, I think that, you know, energy efficiency also is something, as I mentioned, I mean, going back to the Apple well again, but I mean, the fact that you can run jobs, even if it's not the most high power GPU, but at a fraction of the energy cost of a desktop GPU or a server GPU is really, really intriguing. And I mean, there are also use cases where in certain cases, Apple GPUs are, are at least on a node basis, right outside of a data center with massive amounts of end the highest amount of available GPU memory you might need, both for inference, um, which, you know, for us is important as well. I mean, when we're doing like 4K or 6K renders, whether it's, uh, you know, face generation or the like, that that memory really helps. Um, anyway, I'll pause there. 
am I allowed to like uh, share thoughts on that, or was, uh, I don't want to take up like a lot of time because I know that people probably have questions. Yeah, I think we're gonna wrap oh, it up. Good. Since okay, we're totally fair. Over. Totally um, fair. I appreciate yeah. you guys letting me up here. Uh, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Sorry, if you wanna close us out. Awesome. Yeah. No. Um. Really appreciated all our guests that were able to attend and answering the questions. It's a very insightful uh, Twitter space, and appreciate everybody. Uh, you know, fighting through the technical Twitter space difficulties. Um, I just wanted to flag that if anyone listening that's on this call is ever interested in discussing AI slash crypto or is building within the space and wants to talk to the Solana Foundation, my DMs are always open. And um, also feel free to reach out on Telegram, which is uh, D-S-O-B-A, and always happy to discuss. And yeah, just wanted to reiterate Really appreciate our guests for answering the questions and for the audience asking also great questions. Very insightful. And, and one last shout out on behalf of the teams that, that participated. If you uh, like what they're up to, you know, definitely follow them on Twitter. Um, see what they're, you know, keep, keep tabs on them. I think this is a space that's going to get pretty crazy in the coming months and years. So I think this is a, a set of people uh, worth, worth checking in on.